to treat these dogs. We were getting them from the shelter, knowing they had parvo, and we also had dogs that we didn't know had, had parvo. So we wanted them to have a live outcome, so we created a, a way. And this started, uh, you know, as most things do with veterinarians, in my bathroom. And... Um, and then created a system to not spread it all over the world. And then we, uh, we just moved that concept over to our, now that we have a building, now that's where our Parvo Ward lives, which is awesome because I can stay married and all of those good things. Um, so three things that you, have to, you need is dedicated isolation space, medication and supplies, obviously, but dedicated to the ward. We have a saying that whatever enters the ward stays in the ward. It's kind of like Vegas nothing leaves, and, um, and then a team. And our team is mostly volunteer. We have um, UT, uh, the University of Texas is in our town, and they have a ton of uh, nursing students, um, pre-vet, pre-med. All these people want experience, and they can't get it in the real world, and so this is a perfect excuse for them to volunteer. And I've made a deal where I don't write reference letters until they've volunteered 80 hours, and um, it works. So create and follow uh, decontamination protocols. It's obviously critical that the disease doesn't come out of the ward. And um, we have a foot bath for the entrance and exit. As people walk in, you'll see here in a second, as people walk in, this is, this is sort of our makeshift first ward, and now we have a little bit better of a ward. But as people walk in, they, there's a door um, right in front of that sink, and you walk through a foot bath, and then in front of the sink, you take off your street clothes and shoes and hang them up, and then you step over the yellow line on the bottom, and that's where you put on your parvo scrubs and your parvo shoes, and then walk in to the right to where all the puppies are. It's locked, so nobody else can go in there. Um, you know, people are looking for stuff in the clinic, and they, they don't know what parvo, parvo means. You don't want them walking through the parvo ward to try to find a broom or something. Um, they, they have dedicated towels and linens that are in there. We have a washer and dryer that are in there that are dedicated to this. Towel, toilets and sinks. Um, the toilet we use because we, uh, one of my worries, and I don't know if it's a founded worry or not, is that uh, by saving all these puppies, I didn't want all their filth to go to the landfill and then kill a bunch of feral puppies or coyotes or raccoons. And so um, we flush all, all the poop and we wash anything that is not flushable with Clorox. I don't know if it makes a difference or not, but it makes me feel better. Um, the equipment, you know, just standard um, equipment. This is not fancy, as you can tell. There's nothing fancy about it, but it, it works for us. Um, we, we have all the medical supplies. They come, they make a list of what they need. We drop it off, and then it stays in there. Um, when trash comes out, we spray it down with bleach on the outside of it and then take it out. Um, when we have a dog that dies... We do a double bag procedure where they're bagged in the, in the ward, and then we spray that. We move them to the clean area, and then we do a clean bag that comes from outside the ward to take care of them um, to get out. Um, so some of the most important stuff is on intake, verifying a positive test. What We found out the hard way that our shelter was saying parvo positive when they meant bloody diarrhea, and so we thought that meant a test was done and they were actually positive. And they weren't. And so now we retest every dog because we just can't make that mistake again where we put a healthy or a dog with a different type of diarrhea into the ward to get parvo. And um, filling out an intake form, because they're isolated in there and nobody can go in there, we lose track of who's in there. So having an intake form helps us to keep track of who's in the ward and what their movement is throughout the system. Set up vaccinate on intake. Even though they've got parvo, we're vaccinating because we don't want them to get distemper. And that was, um, you'll see, a lesson learned. Um, so every animal gets vaccinated before they're put in their cage and then assessed and treated. These are just for our volunteers to kind of assess where they are. A lot of times volunteers are getting them out of the transport kennel and setting them up in the cage. And we want to be able, we need to know when the vet needs to be rushed in there versus when they come in and do their parvo rounds. Supportive care, you, you all know this. Um, for the most part, it's fluids and antibiotics, and um, this is Bobby Brady's uh, paperwork, and um, it's just very, it's, it's, um, it's like a, pr it's um, pre-written for the most part, so that it's easy to remember, it's easy to keep everybody with the same treatment, it's easy to mark off for volunteers, it helps decrease confusion and make sure that everybody's getting the appropriate meds. About 50% of them have just vomiting and diarrhea, and their treatment is an average of about three days. We do sub-Q fluids on them, sub-Q antibiotics. We don't jump to IV fluids, mostly because we don't have the manpower to place IV catheters on every single one. 
And um, we use Polyflex as our ampicillin choice, which is much cheaper than IV ampicillin. And, um, and then in Batril, like we mentioned. Uh, we also observe if, if the litter mates were in the cage and one breaks with parvo, they all go to parvo. And we have to just watch them and wait. We usually start them on polyflex just to preempt it because sometimes we don't see them for 12 hours and we don't want somebody to be dead. Um, that if we have them on polyflex, we're hoping that we'll preempt a, a septic situation. And then when they stop eating, we're watching for eating. So the minute they stop eating, we don't test them. We just start treating them with the more aggressive Batrol, subcute fluids, metoclopramide, if they stop eating or eat less. Um, puppies, and that's something to, you know, I use a lot, is all puppies should, puppies should be ravenous. And if they're not, there may be something wrong. And that's a good indicator also if you're trying to prevent an outbreak in a shelter is to walk around and give everybody a meatball. And if it's not ravenously eaten, then you should probably look a little bit further at that cage full of puppies. Adult dogs and small breed dogs, you know, that's not the case. But puppies should be ravenous, um, especially if they haven't eaten in a while. Uh, For 40% of them, they have to go to a level 2 treatment, which is IV catheter, IV ampicillin, um, sub-Q, Batril still. Occasionally, we'll do IV Batril diluted in a bag of fluids, um, but for the most part, we're doing sub-Q, Batril, and IV ampicillin. We make up a cocktail of fluids with um, KCL, dextrose, and Reglan, and um, run it at two to three times maintenance. And then um, severe treatment, these are very uncommon, but they have a very high mortality rate. And we will try. We've, we have been able to save some of these. This little dog, um, Pepper, is one of those. But they're hugely intensive time and money. And, um, and for the most part, we just don't have the resources to save them. And we, we probably would euthanize another one like that that is that bad. So for care, excluding staff, which, again, we're using mostly volunteer help, the, the treatment costs are pretty low. And that's why when we charged 150 for a dog adoption, for parvo puppies, we bump it to 225, and we explain to adopters why, that we already, you know, the good news is this puppy will never have parvo again. The bad news is he costs more. And um, they, people don't mind. And, they, and especially if we can break it down, that you're paying for the medic- medicine, and we can't afford to do it if you don't help us. And I know you really want this puppy. So um, it works. The criteria for exit testing... We, we, do, we try to move them through quickly. So, and when this was at my house, there was an urgency there because they, when they start feeling good, oh my gosh, there's, you don't want parvo, post-parvo puppies that feel good in your house because they're tired of being cramped in a little bathroom and they want out and they're digging through your walls and they're barking in the middle of the night. So that was a little bit of urgency put on it in the beginning that we continue. And so if they don't have, if they're being observed, if they have no symptoms for three nights in a row, we'll test them. If they're negative, we'll release them and back to population. Um, if they are positive when they come in and they go through treatment, we wait until we see two consecutive post-parvo um, feces, and that is where they've, they've finished having diarrhea, they're generally dry for a day and a half, and then they're eating, they're eating, they're eating, they're refilling up their intestines, and then they poop again and then again, and then we test their rectum. And 95% of the time it's negative at that point, but there's been one or two that have been positive, so we, we continue to test before, before we leave them, let them leave. And then once they're negative, we go through a bathing procedure where they are um, decontaminated, and uh, we clip their toenails, we scrub out their toenails. It's the mani-pedi of the world for puppies, and um, they don't like it. Clean really well their anal area, and then also do a second bath. And I, I've been wanting to take a photo of a black puppy that looks clean before we do the bath, and then you do the bath, and there's just this red, you know, stuff in the, in the wastewater, and you couldn't see it at all. And so the bath is critical, and the second bath is critical, because you can't, it's just like if you've ever been really, really, really filthy, the first shower just doesn't do it. So you have to um, get them twice. We inspect the paws because sometimes the poop is so caked on there that even if you're scrubbing them with a toothbrush, you don't get it all off. So you need to visually look in between the pads and in the toenails and make sure there's not one speck of parvo poop in there. <clears throat> and then we put, them, we, we put them in the bathtub that is on the entry, uh, right outside the entryway of parvo. Um, the, in between the two baths, the bather puts a gown on, a clean gown over their parvo clothes. And then they finish the second bath. They dry them with a clean towel from out the non-parvo world, put them in a crate, 
and, um, and then clean the entire area, the bathtub and everything with parvocidal clean art, and then go back in the ward and change clothes. And then somebody else picks the puppy up in a clean crate and brings them over to the, um, to the adoption area. So team members, obviously veterinarians are critical for this. Um, veterinary technicians are important also, but it doesn't have to take up a ton of their time. This is another program that is very volunteer friendly, especially for the people that want experience doing medical stuff. And um, you need a volunteer coordinator that can schedule, make sure the shifts are covered, and, um, and then also that can train new volunteers. Um, obviously, it's really hard to lose the puppies that we're trying to save, but I think that the volunteer team handles it really well. They, they recognize that um, it's better than 100% being euthanized and us never knowing about it. Um, so lessons learned, we, we failed to vaccinate at the beginning on intake. We didn't realize that some of these guys had distemper, and then when we put them in close proximity to parvo puppies that didn't have distemper, everybody got distemper, and then the, the um, live outcome became a lot less. Um, our verifying a positive test, I think we already talked about that, and um, generally we're seeing about seven days, so from beginning to end, some, some go longer, some go shorter, and puppies go back immediately to the adoption areas. We've not seen any lasting effects from parvo. Sometimes, um, and I'm suspicious of parvo slash distemper, when I see uh, things like um, just failure to eat even though they're negative or continued vomiting or um, sometimes we will see joint issues occasionally, handful. We've seen joint issues post-parvo, and they warm out of it in about seven days after they are painful. I don't know what that is. Um, it could be immune, um, an immune complex problem from the virus. could be Batril-related. I have no idea. Um, how to prevent a parvo outbreak. So you guys know all this. Um, I won't spend too much time. Identifying earlier, this is where the canned food test comes in handy. So testing, if you feel like you have parvo in your um, area or you've had a couple, just it's so easy. Before you clean their cage, hand them a meatball. And if they're not interested, then don't have anybody touch that cage until you have a chance to test them or isolate them. Um, so we've had no spread of disease to the main shelter. We've had the same number of parvo cases occur that, than we had before parvo lived on the same property. So we haven't had an increase in parvo um, cases in our shelter population. We do have some that occur, but I think that's normal for most shelters. Um, and there's been cases, we, originally our intent was to keep these puppies away from other puppies, so post-parvo that they wouldn't be sharing a pen or a cage or playing together. And with volunteer things, sometimes it doesn't work out the way you want, and so we did have direct contact and still no spread of disease. So I feel pretty good about our ability to or see on a test which ones are still shedding the disease. We have an 80 to 85 percent save rate, and we've treated 800 to 1,000 since 2008. That's it for Parvo. <laughs> Is that good timing? <laughs>